Hi, I'm Tiffany Irvin, Vice President of Public Image for the CART Fund. I want to introduce you to Dr. Levi Wood from Georgia Tech. He was one of the grant recipients from CART in 2019. Now, before he begins his presentation, be sure you subscribe to this channel so you'll be notified of future videos as they become available. And stay tuned till the end because we're gonna share with you some additional information on how you can learn more about the CART Fund. So uh, I came up with this title uh, on the spot the other night when Tiffany called me, uh, but I, I think it does get after a lot of what we're, we're trying to do in my lab. We're trying to figure out how to rebuild the, the immune system so that we can use it to fight Alzheimer's disease. And just to give a little bit of, of overview of what uh, my lab does, we have quite a number of topics that we're interested in. One of them is, uh, is that we look at these uh, gene expression data sets uh, that, that come from post-mortem human tissues, so people who have died from Alzheimer's disease. And these data sets come from uh, many thousands of patients and consists of tens of thousands of the different genes that regulate how cells in the brain work. Um, and we're trying to uncover, you know, what is the earliest uh, dis dysregulation or dysfunction in, in, uh, that we can detect from these samples. Um, so that's where that multivariate data stuff comes in that my lab works on. A little bit uh, uh, off topic, but also very much related, and we think the mechanisms are the same as in Alzheimer's disease. We've been working on this uh, childhood disorder called mucolipidosis 4. It affects children starting in their first year of life, um, and it causes a, progress a progressive deterioration of the brain's functioning. Um, and we've been able to find a lot of the same um, immune uh, dysregulation in these uh, uh, patients that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And so we're trying to translate our way of thinking about Alzheimer's disease into this uh, disease here. Um, one of the, the, the sort of unique aspects of my point of view of, uh, of being in an engineering school um, is that we're sort of viewing uh, immune function in the same way that we view uh, designing an autopilot for, for an airplane. An autopilot for an airplane, you set where you want the airplane to go, and then it should, it may deviate a little bit from that, but you have an active regulatory system in place that's keeping track of where the airplane is and trying to bring everything back in line so that you get to where you wanna be. <clears throat> um, and so we've been building uh, very interesting uh, models very sort of complicated computational models that we, we think we'll eventually be able to use for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then one of the topics I'm gonna to talk about today is that the leaky blood vessels, which have been known to be a big problem in Alzheimer's disease for a while. And we've been finding that leaky blood vessels actually cause uh, the immune cells to, to turn off their normal function. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how to reboot that. And then the, the topic of our CARD award uh, is how we use, how we can tune the use of looking at flickering lights and listening to flickering or uh, uh, sort of clicking audio sounds to, to mobilize immune function in the brain. And then the last one is uh, we uh, were very lucky to get an award from the Department of Defense to learn how um, brain injury can lead to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so this is kind of the overall snapshot of my lab. Uh, all, all of it is really focused around the immune system. Um, and so I thought I might start just at, at sort of the high level of what is Alzheimer's disease and what is it doing? So if you look at a section of a, of a brain, so these are both from people uh, that were about 85 years old when they die. <clears throat> and this is a healthy brain. So you can see it looks very clean. Um, and then this is a section of a brain uh, that had Alzheimer's disease. And so what people talk a lot about is the presence of these amyloid beta plaques. That's kind of this gross looking stuff building up in the brain. What's interesting about these plaques uh, is that they, they are toxic for neurons. And so uh, if you look at a healthy brain, you'll see, you know, it's quite pretty sizable um, and, and it's, it's functioning properly. But because these plaques um, and associated processes are toxic for neurons, the neurons will die and then the brain will start to lose volume. 
loss of this brain matter is what is uh, sort of synonymous or, or happening at the same time as loss of memory, loss of, eventually loss of motor function, and so on. And so people have mostly talked about what's happening to the neurons in this disease. Loss of neurons is really just part of the process. Um, and if you take a closer look at, at what's happening in the brain, the neurons live there together with a number of other cell types. Here we have neurons, and, and here's the plaques, which are toxic to the neurons. Uh, but then the, the neurons can't live on their own. They live together with a number of supporting types of cells, which I'm not going to go into today, uh, but also with the, the neural immune cells, which we call glia. Really, if you just had neurons, they wouldn't make it. They wouldn't function. You wouldn't be able to think. But these neural immune cells, um, they, they have important roles in the brain. Um, and the first one in a healthy brain is they uh, are actually responsible for supporting the neurons. They produce nutrients that the neurons need to, to survive and work correctly. They also are supposed to clear out pathogens like these plaques or even bacterial infections that you can get in your brain. Uh, but the idea is that eventually what, be, what happens in Alzheimer's disease um, is these cells sort of become fatigued. They, they, they get tired and they no longer support the neurons properly or clear the plaques properly. The overall goal of my lab then is to figure out how to remobilize them, revitalize them so that they can, can come in and do their functions correctly. Um, and so this brings me to our first topic. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this topic is to use of non-invasive flashing lights and sounds to stimulate healthy immune function in Alzheimer's disease. And this is uh, a portion of this is funded CART project. And I've been doing this work in close collaboration with my colleague Annabelle Singer, also at Georgia Tech. Uh, and these are the members of our lab who uh, accomplished this work. So really the motivation for this work uh, comes from uh, a study that Annabelle started at MIT when she was a postdoc. Um, what Annabelle found is that you could uh, expose uh, mice to flickering lights and sounds. And what this does is it triggers a coordinated electrical activity in the neurons. And so the way I think about it um, is you get these neurons that are like talking to each other very efficiently. Um, and what's great about this has been known for a while that this, uh, this, these flickering uh, uh, lights and sounds can, can boost uh, the firing in the brain. Um, and then it, it also promotes the ability to learn and remember things. But what was very cool about what Annabelle found uh, while she was at MIT was that by exposing mice to these uh, flickering lights and sounds, uh, you could actually change, so gamma, so this is this 40 hertz uh, flickering light, uh, you could change the morphology from uh, sort of a resting state glia uh, to this kind of angry looking glia, and so it's become activated. She also found that you would be able to clear uh, at least uh, temporarily amyloid beta in Alzheimer's mice, so mice that have been engineered to have Alzheimer's disease, and so you can re reduce the, the level of the plaques in those brains. And so the bottom line from all of this is just by looking at a flashing light, um, it really changes the chemistry of what's happening in your brain. These are a couple of images that show how we uh, expose people and animals to these things. Um, that there are some, uh, some very early trials underway at, at Emory. Uh, we're just starting to get a little bit of data from it now, but I can't say anything definitively at this stage. But you can wear a, a set of glasses that have a flashing light inside. Or when we're working with uh, mice, uh, we expose them uh, to basically a strip of LEDs that are flashing. And then just to show you what this actually looks like in the lab, usually we put them in a, in a dark um, uh, room and then we start flashing uh, these lights at it. So I hope you can see my video, but it's a mouse nothing too terribly exciting happening with this mouse, except it's inside of this box and it's ex exposed to these flashing lights. So what we've been able to find uh, by doing this uh, is that we can, this will probably be the most complicated slide that I show, but if we expose them to these lights for an hour, um, and then we look at a whole bunch of different uh, proteins along the bottom here that control gene, uh, control immune function. And I don't want to get into what they're doing. But the bottom line is that red means there's a lot more. Um, and particularly when we flash at 40 hertz, we get a whole upregulation of these, of these proteins and genes that can drive these immune cells um, to, to, to become activated and do what they're supposed to do in the brain.
And so we've actually been able to look across a, a number of different treatment conditions where we flash lights either at 40 hertz or 20 hertz, uh, even uh, looking at a bright constant light or a light that's kind of randomly shifting between frequencies. And we can elicit different uh, patterns of these proteins produced. Um, and so, of course, we have this uh, immune function that's happening at 40 hertz, which is certainly powerful uh, for being able to clear plaques. Uh, but these other uh, treatment conditions have the ability maybe to suppress inflammation, have the ability uh, to, to uh, promote uh, potentially neuronal or vascular health. We kind of have this, this idea now. Uh, we, we've been uh, assembling a whole collection of data where we know that we can stimulate a mouse by looking at these flashing lights and sounds. We can stimulate activity in neurons where they are, we, we actually uh, have some data showing that it's uh, the neurons that are producing these immune genes that are really controlling what the, the glia are doing and basically recruiting them to, to do their function. Uh, but simultaneously, uh, there also, there's also this feedback we think, where certain of these uh, genes produced uh, can actually come back and promote neuronal health. And ultimately, we think that for Alzheimer's disease treatment, it's not important just to clear the plaques, uh, but also to, to actually really support the neurons, uh, to give them nutrients that they need to stay healthy and survive. Uh, this brings us to the to the topic of of the the project that we've been able to undertake. Thank you to the generosity of of the cart. But basically, the idea is we think that by exploring these different different types of treatment strategies, we're going to be able to identify uh, different patterns of these flashing lights and sounds that can uh, do different important things in the brain. We think some of them are going to be great for pulling out these plaques. Uh, others are going to be great for promoting neuronal health, and there may be others yet that we can use to, to uh, grow new blood vessels in the brain, uh, which would also be good for, for promoting their health. So overall, uh, we're trying to establish this sort of platform where we can produce uh, fancy looking maps like this, relating uh, the frequency of stimulation to the, uh, to the, and the duration of stimulation to how much of these genes are produced. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to affect multiple parts of the brain, but particularly the memory centers, because they're the first ones um, affected in Alzheimer's disease. And so, so this is the basic idea. Uh, so we expose mice, just like I showed you in the box there. And then we can measure up to 30,000 genes in mice. It, it ends up being closer to 20,000. And then we look at different patterns of these genes produced. <clears throat> and then we can map them onto function. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means uh, uh, in a second here. Uh, but uh, so far, we have uh, in our lab grown up a whole collect uh, cohort of mice. Um, so we're going to be ultimately treating around 80 or 100 mice in this project. And before we had to, sh to shut down for coronavirus, uh, we were able to, to gain some initial data on these mice uh, where we can uh, stimulate either at 20 hertz frequency or at the 40 hertz frequency. And we can see that they have completely different effects on the 20,000 genes we were able uh, to measure in the mice. So these ones go up in 20 hertz and these ones go up in 40 hertz. Um, and so I'm indicating on the right here that we've sort of explored two conditions so far. And uh, later on in the next couple of months, we'll be filling in a, a bunch of the different grid uh, locations here. But what does it mean? I mean, this is a, a sort of colorful uh, sort of red-blue rainbow that I'm showing here, but it's hard to look at this and, and gain a lot of meaning. Um, so we uh, have been uh, building, not only us, uh, but others uh, have, have built libraries about what these genes do. And so the way you think about these libraries is, imagine you take a library um, and each book uh, is a function, so like neurons or glia, um, immune function, these kind of things. And then now imagine that you take all of the pages uh, of all of the books and you mix them all together. Uh, so you mix all these pages together, um, and then that's what we have here, is we have a whole library's worth of information uh, in our gene set, but it's all mixed together. 
Um, and so what we and others have been doing uh, is basically going through page by page or basically across all nearly 20,000 of these genes and annotating what each one of those genes do so that we can reassemble them back into individual books. So when we do that, so here's a, a first set that we've been uh, pulling out from top differential genes here. This is a, a book uh, that's involved in acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. It, it helps you think. And then these books over here are associated with uh, these nerve growth factors. So these are actually uh, uh, books that are involved with neurons being becoming more healthy, uh, producing factors that, that cause them to even potentially proliferate. Um, and and, and uh, basically grow new um, synaptic connections. And then this last book here is one that's involved in, in immune function as well. And so we've actually got, to, so we've been analyzing so far in this a total of 4,500 of these books, now sort of segregating out those books that are, we think are the most relevant to Alzheimer's disease at this stage. And so as we move forward with this, uh, we're going to have not just the, these on, only these two conditions for an hour, but a whole collection of frequencies and durations. And what we're going to find is that some of these, uh, these books uh, will be particularly elevated in uh, just the right conditions. Um, and so ultimately we, what we want to do with this um, is be able to say, okay, well, what I really want to do is wear these glasses and get exposed for this amount of time every day uh, so that I can clear plaques. But what it's also looking like is that if you want to promote immune function, maybe make even me sharper uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, really I need a different frequency so that I can, I can activate these books that, that are involved with my neurons talking to each other better. Um, and so that's what we have on this side. So just to summarize this first part, where we've sort of created this uh, capability to stimulate immune cells and we think neurons now uh, in, the, in, the, in the brain by looking just at a flickering light, and actually you can wear headphones like I'm wearing now and listen to a flickering sound. We're finding that different patterns, different frequencies and durations of the stimulation have different results and will be better for different things. Um, and ultimately, we're going to have a whole map that will tell us uh, what kind of, of stimulation we need, what's going to be the best for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. A lot of times these things um, uh, can be uh, sort of evolving as you go. I think from our preliminary data uh, from the, the CART work there, we were surprised actually at how clean it was. It looked like, uh, by the way, all of those were Alzheimer's mice. Um, and so because Alzheimer's mice are not very healthy, a lot of times even just looking uh, among the different mice, uh, you know, that haven't been treated, uh, there can be a lot of variation. And so we were pretty, very pleased so far to see that we were able to get these sort of interpretable, you know, collection books of, of outcomes that, that were meaningful to us. Um, I, I'll tell you my personal opinion about what causes it uh, is that um, initially there is a stress on the, on the neurons, maybe because there's some um, metabolic different uh, problems, you know, it could be any variety of things, but there's a, a stress of some kind that leads the neurons to produce these plaques. Um, and then it sort of causes a self-perpetuating cycle where the neurons are stressed, there's all of the, the plaques being formed, uh, which in turn causes the, the, the glia, the immune cells, to dysfunction. And that stresses out the neurons some more, and then it just evolves this way. Um, and I personally think that the, the reason that all of the, the clinical trials that focus on targeting plaques alone have failed is because the plaques are, it's an important part of it, but it's just one part of the problem. And so by having this way of, of simultaneously targeting those plaques and the health of the neurons, we think that's actually going to be much better for alleviating uh, the, the, the overall mechanism of Alzheimer's. And I would just like to, to take a moment to, to thank, I know a lot of people on this call have been super involved in, in, in everything that CART does. And I, I, 
this kind of work that we're doing to test out these frequencies and, and you know, where we, I think Bill Carson's point was we don't understand the mechanism of Alzheimer's disease, but we also don't fully understand the mechanism of how our flashing lights are causing this function. Um, and so because of that, there's no other way for us to get the, the funding to do this work that we think will be transformative other than this program that you have. And it, it just means the world to us that we can, we can uh, undertake. But, you know, if you have any other questions about this or any other work, I'm always available by email and I'll, I'll be happy to chat anytime. If you'd like to learn more about the CART Fund, visit our website, cartfund.org, and sign up for our newsletter, The Cart Wheel. You can also follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter.